John and Brother Colt. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have, great phrase there, we have. One writer says, we are having. In other words, now. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not we can, we ought to, one day we will, but now. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So, let's understand this. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Being justified by faith, we have access into the grace of God. Okay? In contrast, if we're not justified, we don't have any peace with God. If we're not justified, we don't have any access into the grace of God. We can't get in. If the truck drivers in this area have a friend in the world, it's me. I just don't want them on our church parking lot. See, our friendship has ended when it comes to driving their trucks in here and ripping up the parking lot. So, after the services on Wednesday night and Sunday night, Brother Don and I put these cables up and shut them so these guys or girls or whoever they are driving these big trucks can't come in there and turn around and rip up our parking lot. We don't want them to have access. The person who's never been justified has no access into the grace of God. Think about the connotation of that. Think about the, what that's saying. I've heard people say, well, all a man has to do is just exercise his will. He can do that all he wants to. He still doesn't have any access to the grace of God. See, that's the reason why God has to do something. That's the reason why we pray for God's great mercy. Let's go on. Verse 3, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Patience, experience, experience, hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. We'll read in Romans 8 and Galatians 4 that God, when he saves us, puts the spirit of his son into our hearts. When he does that, he fills us with the love of God. Let's see. For when, verse 6, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. And scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man... Some would even dare to die. Verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Can we understand the grammar of that? We shall. We shall. I hope to eat a good lunch this afternoon. So do you, if I ever get done. But uh, something may happen. I may have a breakdown. Uh, something else. I don't know. I don't, too many things out there I don't have any control of. Roads are wet and slick and all of this. But I am saved from wrath regardless of whatever happens. Think about this, child of God. Someone gets angry with you and they tell you, go to hell. They just get mad at you and tell you, to, you understand if you're a child of God, that is a great opportunity to witness. Because it doesn't matter how mad they get or how many times they tell you, if you've been saved by the blood of Christ, you're not going. 
And you've, they've opened the door and given you a great opportunity to tell them why you're not going. Just rave on, angry person. I'm not going. You see, I know y'all live in such a fashion that you never make anyone angry and never one's, no one has ever gotten so mad at you that they gave you a, a good cousin. Right? Y'all just live your whole lives with both hands on the horns of the altar and everything's just a constant prayer meeting and everybody's in perfect peace with you all the time. It's not that way with me. I don't know why, but some folks just don't like the way I am. I don't know what's the matter with them. Well, I'm not going. They can tell me all they want. I've been saved from the wrath to come through Christ. Verse 10. For if when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. We sang a little bit ago, what a friend we have in Jesus. Well, I want you to understand something. We couldn't always sing that. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. We have now received. We didn't have it. He brought it to us, for us, and applied it to our hearts. Okay? Verse 8. But God commendeth, God proved, God displayed, God manifested, God made known. God made it shown. He, 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 he displayed it. He proved his love toward us. Now, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The love of God. You're familiar with the song, perhaps it goes, the love of God is greater far than tongue and pen can ever tell, goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. I remember Brother Larry Brundage telling the story about that one verse they found written on the wall of an insane asylum. And it said, uh, if... The skies were parchment made, and the oceans were ink, and every man on earth were a scribe, and every stalk a quill. They would cover the skies and drain the oceans dry, writing, describing, explaining the love of God. Ephesians 2 says, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Isaiah 38 verse 10 says, Thou hast in love for my soul delivered it from the pit. Isaiah 63 9, In his love and in his mercy he redeemed them. John 3 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6, it said, He loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood and made us kings and priests. I want, he, he, here in His love, 1 John 4, 10, Here in His love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and gave His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. You see, this is not about me finding God. This is about God finding me. Amen. This is not about me receiving God. This is about God receiving me. Amen. You see, he loved us. Washed us from our sins in his own blood. And made us kings and priests unto God. The Bible tells us in Titus, he redeemed us unto himself. A peculiar people, zealous of good works. His great love. So I want to talk, Easter is coming. We'll be talking about the resurrection. I want to talk to you this morning about Christ's death. I want us, when we leave here today, to, and, and for our time that we have, I want us to be focused on the death of Christ. I want us to think about it. And I want us, in all that we go through in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, why do I put this thing in the pocket if I'm not going to turn it on? Uh, some aspects of the love of Christ. 
But every one of them is motivated by a love that you and I can't comprehend. See? I hope the grandchildren don't get upset with me. If they do, they're young and they'll live over it. But uh, young Wyatt had been... <laughs> That's my boy. <laughs> uh, young wife's been wanting a phone. Well, I had an old iPhone in the dresser. So Donna said she goes and takes care of getting that fixed up. So we go to pick the kids up from school the other day. And we got, I got Wyatt and Haley first. And then, so I say to Wyatt, I said, call Abby. He said, I don't have a phone. So I give him that one that Diane had got hooked up for him, all working. And he says, oh, Poppy, I love you. I love you. I love you. Let me tell you, wait till you get one. Then you'll understand it. Not phone. Grandson. You just wait. When they start this I love you business, whoo. I'm telling you, it's good, man. I'm telling you. It, it's just so good. God's love permeates this torturous death. The Bible tells us in the book of Philippians that he was obedient unto death, and then there's a very important phrase used in Philippians, I said one, Philippians chapter two. He was obedient unto death, and then it says even the death of the cross. The phrase the death distinguishes the death of Jesus Christ from every other death in history before and in history after. When it says the death, even the death of the cross. In grasping, it's a lingering death, first of all. It wasn't, you're a blasphemer. You've said you're the son of God. Pow! I've read a book about one of the Nazi extermination camps in Germany. If I pronounce it right, Auschwitz. Some of you have read about that. There were German officers that spent hours, hours at a time shooting Jews in the back of the head. One after another, just bang, bang, bang. All day long, they're executing Jews. But it, right there, and it's instant. The death, the death of the cross was not instant. It was designed, if, if I, I, I wish I knew more how to illustrate this, the death idea. It's this, this death designed to take a long time. It's designed for criminals such as, uh, you, you think about me and people that are just monstrously vile. Uh, I've read of men that have been tied up to a post, tied to a tree, or tied and bound in a chair, and then forced to watch their wives and children be raped and killed and mutilated. And they were forced to watch it. You think, well, that kind of a person, ah, they deserve this terrible, this monstrous death. That's the death of the cross. It was designed for the awfulest, the worst, the nastiest, scoundrel, vilest, perverted, immoral, filth of society. That's what the crucifixion was designed for. You see, we think of these vile, these people that just... Hebrews 2, 9, he tasted death for every man. Let me remind you as we think about how awful some of these things are that we've read about. If any man keep the whole law, yet offend at one point, he's guilty of them all. Let me remind you, when we think about the death of the cross, that was my death. 
not this monster that tied the daddy in the chair and forced him to watch the mutilation and rape of his own family. No, that's my death. I'm that perverted monster he died for. Can we understand that? It's a lingering death designed to be torturous, designed to last for hours. You read about the scourging where they tied him and stretched him out over a post and then beat him in the back. The Jewish historians say the flesh was ripped away to where the vital organs are exposed. I tell you again, the ground under the cross of crucifixion was a bloody mud hole. I feel dressed a number of deer and hogs and turkeys and stuff, and I hunt. And it's, it's just, the fun's over after you shoot them. But it's nothing like what took place on the cross. Nothing. The volume of blood. Men on the cross in crucifixion died because they could not breathe out. God commended his love toward us. While we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. What I'm wanting you to see this morning, that's my death. That's my death. How great is our God. How great is his love that he would suffer the death. It was a lingering death. It went on and on. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon him. By his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, he loved us. Washed us from our sins in his own blood. He didn't just cut himself. I'm, what, I've, I've seen it growing up, and now I'm living it. Some of you men are, have faced this already. You get to a certain age, it seems all of a sudden your skin gets real thin. And I was trying to drive a screw when I was putting up that mailbox up there, one of the downsides of keeping the big trucks off, you also keep the mail person off. The parking, so they don't come in, put the mail in the box here. So I didn't put one out. Anyway, I'm trying to drill a hole in that thing the other day and drive a screw in it. And I was pushing it a little bit too hard and that drill driver jumped up and pow! And I just bled, bled all over the place because my skin's getting so thin and my blood's getting thin. That's not what happened on the cross. When it said he washed us from our sins in his own blood, they beat him in the scalp. You read in the Bible, it says they buffeted him. You read about that buffeting, it was a designed beating to make it difficult for a man to do this. Cause pain. They put the crown of thorns on his head. You read the Gospel of Mark and then took the scepter, the rod, and after the crown of thorns are there, then they beat him over the head. Driving the thorns into the skull. If you've ever seen one have their, the skin on their skull ruptured, you just bleed like a fountain. Big old Rottweiler dog one time bit Joel, our son Joel, when he was about six. Ha! Oh. That baby boy would climb up my arms all the time and say, Daddy, you ever let anything get me? Nope, son, they get you, they got to get me. I don't know how many times he'd crawl up my, Daddy, you ever going to let anything get me? Nope, son, they get you, they got to get me. We go to look at this property one time, and I'll be switched. If that stupid dog didn't get him, bit him all in the head right there, bit him there, then bit him in his little arm, and you can ask her, he just bled all down his little white shirt. Obedient dog, done had all the papers and done all the tricks, but decided he's going to eat Joel. You've seen somebody, where are you going with that? You get the skin on your skull punctured, you just bleed like a fountain. I can help you understand that a little bit. 
blood, blood, since Diana had her stroke, blood going up to the brain is under pressure from the heart. Going back from the brain back to the heart, it's just gravity. Arteries are under pressure from your heart. Veins are just under blood pressure. See, aren't you glad you came to church today? A lingering death. Something else, a loathsome death. An awful death. I'll tell you again, the death of the criminal, the death of the vile, the death of the dregs of society, the filthiest, the most immoral, the most perverse. You see, that's us. He was wounded for our iniquities. Our, study that word iniquities. Our perversions. Oh, we want to step back and look down our big self-righteous noses and say, I ain't like them. Oh, yes, you are. And so am I. And that's the death he died, a loathsome death. The Bible says, well, let's read it. In Hebrews, he despised the shame, but endured it all in joy. It, it, it's a paradox. It, it's, it's, it's almost, con it just doesn't make sense. Verse 2 of Hebrews 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You, you ever started something you didn't finish? Well, Jesus didn't. He started our faith. He's going to finish our faith. Eternal security. Once saved, always saved. Because once faith, always faith. He started our faith. He's the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. I can't explain that. You ever get blamed for something you didn't do? I don't know, but I don't do well with that. I worked framing houses for a while, and I worked on the ground as a sawman. And they cut, they, we were cutting in a hip roof on a real fancy house up in Colleyville. And they're hollering down angles for me for a piece of decking, and I'm having to cut that piece out. And looking at it on the ground, it just looks like a terrible mistake, but it fits up there. And so I throw that up there to those guys, and they nail it down. Well, one guy walking across there later stepped on that because they nailed it down with no brace under it. And so if it hadn't been for his shoulders, he'd have fallen all the way down to the concrete floor in the garage. And the foreman come around the corner and was cussing me for old Billy Heck. I said, hold up. I said, I cut that piece of decking and threw it up there. I didn't do the framing under it. He said, well, i got to cuss somebody. I said, well, not me. You cuss them hippies up there, those marijuana-smoking nuts up there. Well, Christ was cursed. He was cursed for our sin. He was wounded for our transgression. He was made filthy. He was made vile, a loathsome, a lingering, a pitiful, terrible death. It was a legal death. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, he died at the hands of God. He didn't die at the hands of the Jews or the Romans. You read Acts 2, 23 and Acts chapter 4. All of this was designed by God. Acts 4, 26 to 28. You'll see all of this was designed by God. God is the righteous judge. He made Jesus Christ guilty of our loathsome perversions and transgressions and then punished him. It was a legal death. Though he was innocent, he was made guilty. So as guilty, it's a righteous legal death. We were made righteous. He was made guilty. You see, it's a legal death. It was a lonely death. I'm hurrying. A lonely death. 
in the examination, in this beating, the disciples all forsook him. They all fled. Jesus told Peter, before the cock crows, you'll deny me. On the cross, Jesus cries out. He says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Remember Hebrews 13, 5 it is, I believe, 13, 8. He said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Why? Because God forsook his son for my sin. He died alone. He died alone. He laid down his life to keep the death from lingering on into the Sabbath. They came around somehow and broke the men's legs so they could not push up to breathe and exhale. They broke the legs of the one thief. They came to Christ. He's already dead. The Bible said he gave up the ghost. He didn't hold his breath till he suffocated. He exhaled it. How many of you parents, I've seen this on other parents, and their kids who, well, they just get so mad at me and I try to discipline, tell me they're going to hold their breath. Spank them, they'll breathe. You start that, they're going to go, Preacher, ah. you're crazy. Told you that 12 years ago. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Don't you spank him without reading the word of God to him. That's abuse. I've sat in the children's protective services and explained the biblical instructions of discipline to them and had the authority person sitting there. We got no problem with that. Reading the scripture with them, showing them where they're wrong, and then applying corporal punishment. See, the rod and God's not taken by surprise by all of these nutcases that tell us they're experts in raising children. All right? A lonely death. He died alone. He suffered. There were two thieves, but only one Savior. He died alone. His loving death. Romans 5, verse 5. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. And he's manifested that and proven that by the death of the cross. On page 324, let's stand together. I want to read something to you, then we're going to sing it. In your hymn book. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet. Sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a, rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small? Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul my life, my all. What effect does the loving death of Jesus Christ have on you? Our Heavenly Father, help us to bear these thoughts in our